David Isaacson, welcome to the Real Clear Values podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> David, I'm so interested to speak with you. I know we've been speaking for a little while now about trying to set something up so that we can talk. And my real interest in speaking with you is that you are, by definition and by every measure, an expert in rhetoric. And rhetoric seems to be so topical right now. I know just before the call, we were talking about how it's always relevant because it's part of how humans communicate with each other and they persuade each other. But now it feels particularly relevant. And it's particularly, I feel particularly relevant in how we communicate values with one another as well. So could you just give us a little bit of an overview in the expertise that you have in relation to rhetoric? Okay. Well, uh, it started really when I, um, when I started in my bachelor's program, I had this uh, course that was called pragmatics, which talks about how, how we create meaning uh, in the interplay of language between each other. And uh, that's where I was first introduced to rhetorical concepts. And what I understood that um, from that study was that um, a lot of the things that I was doing right when I was writing my arguments in university papers, I was, I was often um, not necessarily more knowledgeable than my co-students, but I was a better able to formulate arguments. And I was doing some things naturally that... Uh, that rhetoric was really the art of understanding how people could do that um, and what I was doing. And so uh, after a, uh, a brief master's in uh, uh, translation and interpreting at uh, UCLan, I went on to take a master's in, uh, in English at BYU with a focus in rhetoric and composition and decided I wanted to go fur further with that. So I took a PhD in, uh, in rhetoric and composition at TCU um, and uh, I've had, my focus is uh, really uh, rhetoric. Uh, composition is more about the, the art of teaching to write, learning, learning writing, writing pedagogy and so on, uh, writing research. Uh, but my real focus and passion has really been in, in rhetoric and uh, both the classical and what you would call the new rhetorics, where we talk about some people like Kenneth Burke, Kyle Perlman, uh, Stephen Tolman, and so on. So, um, and along with the, the study of it, I've also uh, tried to apply the principles. I, uh, I try to work on becoming a better communicator myself and uh, especially the ethics of it. I, I'm very yeah. passionate about. Interesting. We'll, we'll definitely get on to talking about the ethics of it, certainly, especially in relation to this podcast and its focus. How would you... Well, just, just to mention, just... But just to mention yeah. uh, a little bit about the ethics, I mean, my, my PhD, my dissertation topic uh, was the Manhattan Project researchers and um, uh, the arguments and thinking that went into making the atomic bomb. Right. Wow. OK, well, yeah. that's, that's <laughs> certainly an ethical question and, and something that, that, that requires considerable discussion about in, in relation to, to, to the rights and wrongs, not just about who has the slickest argument. So. That's quite interesting in and of itself. How would you how would you define rhetoric then to a layman, somebody who's coming mm -hmm. to this from from the outside and they, they don't know anything about it and they, they think it's just simply about just trying to, to persuade? Is is there anything more to it than that that you'd like to say? Well, I mean that that comes a bit from uh, Aristotle's definition of it, right? So Plato was saying that rhetoric is just kind of a knack to know where the audience itches and then scratch it, essentially, in, in one of his books. In the other book, he's much more fa favorable towards it in, in the Phaedrus. Mm -hmm. um, but then Aristotle comes and sets up its, his school and includes rhetoric as one of the arts and uh, writes the book, The, uh, the Art of Rhetoric. And there he says that, that rhetoric is the art of finding the available means of persuasion in any given situation. Mm. So it's understanding not just like um, what... So what would be persuasive in this situation? What for this audience uh, does persuasiveness look like? Um, and mm. being able to make the best argument for something, whether or not you're finally able to persuade that audience or not, at least you've made the base best case for it, say it that way. Yeah. Um, okay. So it's understa understanding the audience, understanding um, how we are persuaded, what, how we make decisions, and the, the role that, um, that language, symbols, and so on uh, plays in that process. Mm. 
So how, how is that broken down then? How, how does one determine what the, the potential parameters are for, for persuading somebody? I mean, the way that Aristotle breaks it down, it's, it's very serv- serviceable, but it, it's, not, it's not everything, of course, but it, mm-hmm. it helps as a good way to get in, right? Where he says that, um, that there are three main things or main categories of things that we're persuaded by, right? He talks about ethos, pathos, and logos. You may have mm-hmm. heard about those before. <clears throat> Essentially, sometimes we're persuaded by the credibility of the speaker just by itself, just someone with inherent credibility or the way they uh, purport themselves, the way they carry themselves carries credibility, inherent credibility. And we trust them, not because we know anything about the argument, but just because we trust that person. And sometimes Mm. that trust comes from personal relationship. We trust our mom in some ways, right? Um, Mm. Other times it comes from someone who's who's third been rigorous about what they've been studying, uh, show a balance in the presentation of it, and also uh, radiate a kind of goodwill towards their audience, right? So that's the yeah. that's the credibility argument. That's that's the ethos. Uh, and there's a lot more that goes into that. But uh, and then other times we're not persuaded pr- primarily by uh, that the case itself changes, but our emotional relationship to that case changes. Mm. Right. So uh, suddenly we're not just bystanders anymore. We're we're involved. Uh, and we all know that we make different decisions when we're in different kinds of mood, different, uh, have different feelings, right? Yeah, of uh, course. And then the third one is logos, where it talks about different ways of chains of argumentation, how things are, how we structure the arguments, how we build up a case, essentially, uh, and different ways of doing that. And then there are the the um, uh, strategies of persuasion in the different, those th- of ethos, pathos, and logos. And then there are fallacies where you have an argument that kind of looks like an argument, but really it's a, it's a method of manipulation. It actually doesn't have a good basis. Mm. So there are the strategies and there are the fallacies. And the, the strategies are primarily ethical and the, the fallacies are kind of different forms of manipulation. Right. Okay. Uh, so that, that, that would be kind of like yeah. somebody trying to win an argument almost at any cost. Right. So, for example, we talk about the ad, ad hominem. That's not an argument. Yeah. That's a fallacy, right? Yeah. But you're, so not, that, attacking, that means, you're not talking about the... Yeah. Sorry, ad hominem. That that's against. Is that against the person? Does that mean like an right. attack on the person that you you're arguing right. with or so debating with? I mean, a, a usual metaphor is that uh, you're not you're not going for the ball anymore. You're going for the player, right? Yeah, that's sure. why it's a foul, right? So yeah, you're not, so you're not, you're not debating the topic anymore. You're trying to just tear down your uh, your counterpart or the one that you're arguing against, and you're trying to mm. win by doing that rather than the the merits of the case itself. Yeah. So that, that's kind of like the inverse of ethos then, isn't it? So in, in, right. in terms of somebody building up their ethos and their, their credibility of character and their authority in an area, somebody else would then say, well, actually, no, you're not an authority in this area. In fact, you're not an authority at all. I'm going to I'm going to strip that down. Is that fair to say? Um, I mean, it, it depends, because sometimes you do have to make arguments about whether or not someone is credible. Mm. Um, and so not all arguments are ad hominem. Uh, I do think that, for example, whoever who becomes the prime minister, a character matters a lot, right? <laughs> it, sure, it doesn't absolutely. matter. Absolutely. Uh, it's it's just uh, when you're using it in a setting where that's not appropriate, where it's mm-hmm. like, uh, I'm right because of this. The one person says, and everyone says, actually, you're a stupid guy that uh, in the past voted for this thing and has nothing to do with the case at hand. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so so you can have like rebuttal of ethos, for example, and so on, you can have uh, good cases to be made about whether or not you have a, a strong credibility on that issue, whether or not uh, someone who's just a doctor has a doctorate in uh, mechanical physics is any good at climate change. Mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. those kind of things. That, that's yeah. arguments of ethos. And that's that's fine. That's, you know, that's that's because that's relevant, right? Yeah. The thing is when you try to bring it in without it being without it being relevant. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's a very good distinction. I think it's an important distinction because we can't just say that the character is never going to be relevant if we're talking about people that we, we, we choose to be our leaders. I, th- I think it's very relevant. But like you say, I think that that's really important to note that it's about relevance. It's about appropriateness in terms of right. what what are the issues that we're looking at? What are the facts we're looking at? What are the character traits that we're looking for in this particular person? And, and are they demonstrable in that person or in those persons? So very interesting. So this is great. So, so we've, we've kind of gone right back to, to the, 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 the roots of this in terms of the ancient Greeks. Right. What, what is the, so, so, so where have we gone from there? So, so in terms of the, the historical and the cultural 
significance of, of rhetoric? How does it how does it play a role in in our world today? And and what's the journey it's kind of gone on since the times of ancient Greece? How many books do you want to read me to <laughs> yeah, re- recite question, on the topic? Eh? I, there's <laughs> there's a lot. I, I'd have to, I'd like to say that uh, the uh, the growth uh, of rhetoric was uh, inherently connected to the growth of democracy. Mm. Um, because people care about arguments where arguments actually matter and can have force and and power uh, rather than just the the whims of the despot yeah of the tyrant right and so uh, you had this starting essentially at the some people say they the studied art of rhetoric as kind of as an art as a, a discipline uh, began in in Syracuse at the fall of the dictator. There was a, a dictator there that was um, overthrown, and afterwards there were all these uh, land disputes about what he had granted, what he had taken away from certain families, uh, mm. and what belonged to whom. And at that point, uh, there arose then two teachers of rhetoric, Corax and Titius, um, who uh, had remarkable success in helping people to get their land back, essentially, to make their claims, even if they didn't have the best connections or were the most wealthy, um, were able to make the, the weaker arguments stronger in some ways, um, or the weaker stronger. Um, and then that was uh, they were sent as ambassadors to Athens, um, along with Gorgias from, uh, from another city, who was also a teacher of rhetoric. And they then kind of led to a, a blossoming of the study of rhetoric in Athens. Uh, and they mm-hmm. were some of the first teachers that really kind of brought that to the forefront and made that into such a popular movement that even uh, Socrates and Plato had to comment on it. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and uh, Isocrates famously built a school of rhetoric that uh, where Cicero says from that school proceeded as um, a flood some of the greatest men of Athenian history and Athenian culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he was teaching them how to participate, how to make right speeches, how to participate in the public forums and be able to, to make arguments that had real impact and were able to, um, to shape, shape the, the future of Athens. Wow, so, so it, got, it got people's attention because people understood just how powerful it was, just how potent a, a tool set it could be in, in effecting change and bringing about change, like you say, without status or without money as well. Right. I mean, you had to have some, yeah. some money to be able to, to attend the school in the first place. Sure. Uh, but Isocrates himself, he made his way essentially by being a teacher of rhetoric um, and became a diplomat for Athens uh, to, to negotiate treaties and so on. And then spoke in the assembly uh, and was listened to by many when he talked about, for example, on the peace is one of the most eloquent pieces of, uh, of rhetoric for, for a peace treaty in favor of a peace treaty that, that, that I've read. Mm. Um, and so after him, essentially, Aristotle said it would be a shame to, to, uh, to be silent and let Isocrates speak because that was the default. He was the one everyone was listening to. Um, and he decided to try to make it a bit more scientific and kind of try to categorize these things, uh, these pieces of advice that, that Isocrates had, had made and these, these practices that were very successful, a very successful pedagogy. Um, mm. And they made that into his book, The Art of Rhetoric. Um, and then that gets continued in, in Athens um, and gets uh, transported further to, to Rome and adopted by, by the Roman the Romans who also have a form of democracy or republic mm-hmm. where speech also is powerful um, and where for Cicero becomes the perhaps the uh, epistemy or the the absolutely pinnacle of that arch some say there's no, never been a more eloquent person than him mm. um, who also by the power of speaking was able to rise from his kind of middle class to become the um the leader of rome the, who was able to suppress uh, an oligarchic rebellion mm. <laughs> or a rev- <laughs> revolution of uh of uh, what's it called again catiline the catiline re- re- revolution that was a pref- he was a precursor in some ways, probably you could say, to uh, to Caesar. Um, tried to keep the republic from falling into despotism and from falling into uh, tyranny, and then mm. was killed 
uh, for that effort by uh, by Emperor Augustine and Marcus Antonius, who hated him. <laughs> mm, mm. And then, however, because he was so eloquent, the dream of rhetoric and the dream of eloquence and the dream of this kind of free person speaking and speech having power uh, remained um, and was very great, a very great uh, inspiration, actually, to, for example, the founding fathers in America. And they read yeah. Cicero, they read, read Demosthenes and others. Um, and they were all talking about this, this freedom to speak and give these kind of arguments and this eloquence where arguments matter. Yeah. Um, and so it really was being able to have that uh, maintained really became uh, crucial to the birth or rebirth of democracy in, in the modern age. Mm. Um, and so the, if you read those early ones, I mean, John Adams was saying, telling, telling to his sons, you know, read Demosthenes. Uh, it's great for the patriotic spirit and just being able to speak like him will, will uh, or a little bit like him will benefit you greatly in life. Uh, and then we had a kind of a move towards kind of scientism that ended up becoming very kind of critical of everything that was an art and couldn't be strictly um, kind of limited into a science. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so, it, so couldn't, it couldn't be, it couldn't be, it couldn't be quantified. quantified. Yeah, right. Right, and it, and then yeah, they went back to the same thing that that Plato said, which this is just a kind of a knack. It's a kind of magic. These orators, they're just uh, leading the crowd with this kind of magic that we don't understand. This this thing that we need to somehow stop, mm. um, rather than rather than try to understand it better and and be able to promote the better kinds of of it. I would say. Um, and so it, it fell a little bit into disfavor in this kind of scientific moment in the, in the academia, at least. Yeah. And when, when was that? When did that? Air, you'd say like uh, the rise of positivism probably uh, was a big part of it. Uh, so 1920s, 1930s, and then mm. to the early post-war uh, World War II era, um, mm. where there you get these uh, psychologists essentially and these people talking about mass psychologists psychology and uh, and sociology uh, Lippmann wrote the public opinion and said that essentially the through use of advertising symbols slogans all these things that are happening in the advertising industry uh, anyone who wants to and has a little bit of money can shape public opinion however they want to Mm. And that that becomes essentially the the mode of democ democracy is essentially dead because anyone who has the means can do these things, right. um, and that's a little bit of a oversimplification, I would say, of of the human mm. mind and public opinion. But mm. it was something that could be quantified, right? They started this yeah. early kind of okay, we play this thing, and then so and so many people change their opinion about things. They were also, of course, promoting their own art, the art yes. of the public opinion advisor or what became the public relations relations professional mm. um, and so it became rather than an art it became this thing that was supposed to be a science you're supposed to be have empirical measurements you're supposed to be able to give a deliverable to a client and be able to see a net benefit and so and so much uh, increase in the opinion polls of people that agreed with you yeah um, and and the whole matter of, of persuasion became uh, essentially treating people like lab rats. Yeah, okay. So it sounds like a very reductive approach. Right, because that's what scientism is, essentially. Is if it can't be measured, it's not worth anything. Mm. Mm. Right? So, so it's not science science in itself, but this kind of yes. idea of that, that everything has to mirror science, and if it doesn't, then it's, then it's yeah. uh, essentially bunk, or it's, it's, it's nonsense, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So, so how did uh, so how did how did rhetoric how did, or or has rhetoric found found its way back from that then what what was the 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 redemption if there has been such a thing of of rhetoric or the perceived value of such because we have this we have these debates in society today about the value of humanities subjects for example universities right. which teach which teach critical thinking things like history things like English why does anybody want to do that when you can't then go and become a coder or an engineer right off, off the right. bat. So, so, right. so where exactly. are we with this now in relation to, to rhetoric? It used to be the queen of the humanities, rhetoric. Mm. It was kind of seen as the, the pinnacle and it used to be the, the, the capstone course 
uh, that you took to kind of make your entrance into public life. Um, it was one of the, uh, it was part of the Roman trivium, right? The, the, the grammar, the rhetoric and philosophy, right? The, or the grammar, the math, mathematics and the rhetoric. Mm. Um, and it's nowhere close to that now. Um, in the academia, it's uh, in the language departments, it's a little bit of a stepchild somewhere between linguistics and literature. <laughs> mm, sure. Um, it's kind of clawing its back w right now and being invited back to a certain extent because of its relevance that I think is becoming much more um, apparent. Uh, I think as a society, we still are um, very much in the thrall of public, public relations experts that use as their basis these mass psychology tests and uh, methods. Mm. Um, I talked to a, a, a public communica a communications consultant in the uh, in Netherlands, and he talked about how um, Daniel Kahneman, who is also a psychologist, yeah. or psych, psych, uh, talked about the, um, you know, thinking fast and slow, mm -hmm. that um, framing and being able to uh, essentially give prompts, emotional prompts to people to go into that fast thinking mode, get scared of things or in, in different ways, swallow things without thinking about it. That's, that's a lot of what uh, is seen as the art of public relations these days. Mm. And so yeah. it, again, it's, it's, it's um, in some ways it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You treat people like lab rats, they become lab rats because that's kind of what you encourage in their minds. Um, mm. But I think that it, it's built on a very simplistic and overly simplistic view of um, of the human brain. Yes. And, yeah. Um, and, and, and also yeah. maybe the human spirit as well, because yeah. there are people who, like you and I, we're having this conversation now, and we have we have the sentience to to realize what's going on. It's it's not like we're just animals where things are just happening to us. We have this this additional awareness where we can we where we can pick this out, and we can actually choose that we're not going to behave or react in certain ways which which really makes it interesting and that that really actually flies in the face of of the whole ethos and, and approach of of those who are trying to treat the mass or the herd in in such a manner so in terms of in terms of flipping this a little bit david i'm, I'm interested in picking up on what you mentioned earlier about the the ethics or the values that that underpin rhetoric because rhetoric is is not like you said before the call it isn't amoral it isn't devoid of any sense of morality or right right or wrong so so what are the ethics that, that underpin rhetoric mm -hmm. um well first of all so uh um this depends a little bit on um what again you define as it right so i'm going mm -hmm. a little bit from uh from uh You could say um, a certain point of view of, of rhetoric, right? So some people say like, oh, that's just rhetoric. That's like in political talk, that's very often says as, okay, anything that's just speech meant to deceive or be able to win an argument rather than something that you really mean. Yeah, right? okay. Um, so uh, what, what I would say is rhetoric is concerned with persuasion was often mislabeled as rhetoric is really kind of man manipulation right so yeah psychological manipulation is a type of, of social influence this this is a quote on it that aims to change the perception or behavior of others through underhanded deceptive or even abusive tactics mm. so by by advancing the interests of the manipulator often at the other's expense such methods could be considered exploitative uh, abusive devious and deceptive um, and though they may have the same end in mind, the process is different. So there's a certain ethics in the process by itself. Mm. Um, you could say in some ways, uh, manipulation is a method that stops working once the other person knows what you're doing. Yeah. Does yeah, that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah, completely. That, that completely makes sense. The, the game's up then, isn't it? It's, it's a case of, right. well, now I know what you're trying to do. I can see the angles that you're coming from and actually I can, I can mitigate them. And I might even introduce contrary arguments or other facts that, that I'm aware of that you haven't presented, which actually rebut your argument and, and put a hole in it. So, okay, I interesting. I, and I like how you brought in the, the common assumption that, that rhetoric or the common use or the, the offhand use of the word rhetoric as being 
oh well, it's just it's just rhetoric as if as if it counts for nothing. But of course, there's, right. there's much more to it than that, isn't there? In, in terms of in a in a strict sense of the the art of rhetoric, right? And so I'd say like just inherently in the in the process by itself, uh, rhetoric is more moral than than manipulation in the sense that because it actually uh, uh, tries to persuade rather than kind of slip through your consciousness in some mm. kind of way. <laughs> Sure, you know, sure. Like like all these other things trying to do. So I can, mm -hmm. a, a very good speech, I can rhetorically analyze the speech and afterwards I feel even more persuaded. Yes, very good. Does that make sense? Yeah, it completely like, makes sense. Because now I see the basis of it and I'm actually even more persuaded or even more kind of like, wow, this is really very well done. Mm -hmm. um, rather versus, uh, versus something where we're like, oh, you just did that to me, and uh, yes. I feel I feel cheated now. I feel I feel like you have been used. I feel feel cheap, right? Mm, completely. I, I think about when you say that. I think about some of the great speeches of history, and I think a lot about FDR's speeches, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, especially in World War Two, because World right. War Two was very much a, that was a war of values. You had you had Hitler and also Mussolini as well, who had espoused fascism, and this idea of there being a superior race and they flat out rejected any sense of equality any sense of democracy any sense of liberalism was was flat out rejected but then you had right. fdr who was very very clear when he, he spoke about things like the four freedoms even when he spoke about the only thing you have to fear is fear itself that's very powerful and it's a very powerful phrase but but speaking specifically about the four freedoms set him up as a diametric opposite to Hitler and Mussolini and that's powerful for me I think because like you say we know what he's trying to do we know the case that he's making we know what he's up against and you think well which would you rather have when when we look at where FDR was coming from in relation to Hitler and Mussolini we can see what FDR is trying to do we can see where his stake in the ground is or where his stakes in the ground are and what he's opposing and then we can make a decision about which which way we think is is preferable to us because value is essentially about beliefs, about what's going to give us and society in general a better outcome over the long term as well. Right. Mm. I mean, I, I'm I'm reminded of uh, this uh, uh, English diplomat that uh, went to, to talk to uh, Napoleon about a peace treaty, and uh, at the end he said, like, well, if you do that, what you're saying, um, many thousands of your your citizens will die. And Napoleon said, looks at him and says, do you honestly think I care about the lives of my countrymen? Mm. And uh, the English diplomat said, I knew I had him then because you could not open this window and say that on the street and still remain in power. Mm. Um, and so, uh, yeah, there's, there's a big difference there where, you know, the, the Hitler's rhetoric, it really relied on a lot of lies and a lot of manipulation. It really was his speeches uh, were uh, a distortion of reality. Uh, they required the people to swallow a lot of uh, false information in order to even believe those things. And they required the active production of a lot of lies through their propaganda ministry and Goebbels and so on. Um, and uh, I would say we have a similar uh, situation today in some ways where, you know, we have a, a time of, certain moral clarity and Zelensky is definitely someone who's a gifted you know gifted actor gifted speaker uh, but it's also the moment that has its own eloquence um, in, in a way and his position as being the speaker for people being attacked rather than the aggressor yeah um, and there's a market difference between the, the the arguments and the speeches made by him and by and by Putin right now yeah and that, that's interesting so so you talk about the false information that Hitler and the Nazis had to create to form a basis for what Hitler was saying in his speeches and how Hitler's speeches, Hitler's rhetoric, if you like, rested on that false information. But then you brought in Zelensky in Ukraine and then Putin in Russia and comparing those two. Now, when we think about misinformation, what, what astounds me, especially in the situation in Ukraine, is that there are so many who are online talking on Twitter and all over the internet 
about the corruption of Ukraine and the, the corruption even of, of Zelensky and talking about how it's his fault for for this happening, almost as if almost as if they're absolving Vladimir right. Putin of, of these actions of, of the invasion, of the bombing, of the terrible atrocities that are going on. And it is absolutely astounding that, that people in a democratic a democratic nation like the United States are propagating this informa- these narratives which go against not just uh, the Ukrainian people, but also against the United States as well, also, also against their own country, as if to say, right. well, those guys are on the other side. I'm on this side. They're on the other side. So I'm going to stick with my narrative and to hell with what happens over in Ukraine, because by the way, it's, it's Zelensky's fault. That, that's kind of how I read it in terms of what's, right. what's going on at the moment. But there's, there's so much information that's being churned out and how on earth anybody can can determine what is true and what is false is, is beyond me. But but the sheer volume of it and the way that it's being used in very partisan ways is, is quite alarming. Right. So, uh, I mean, there there's uh, in, in some ways you can have different kinds of arguments that are uh, just by choosing this these pieces of information and overlooking these other ones, mm. you, you can get you know, you can use facts for both of them uh, sure. and you come to very different conclusions. That That's definitely the case. But I also think there is um, there is a, a lot of uh, good evidence and a lot of people working to produce that good evidence. Um, and it is a market difference that Ukrainians, to a great extent, can just state things the way they are and they make, mm-hmm. that makes an argument in itself. Whereas... Um, uh, Russia Today and uh, other Sputnik and other propaganda apparatus, they're working overtime to try to, where they used to work overtime to try to create a causes belly, a reason for war, uh, and now have to work uh, overtime to try to retroactively change history or to expand or um, invent uh, atrocities or other events. Um, essentially, in order to to support their case right yeah so yeah yeah so, is, so, so this really there is something that there's something that aristotle says where it may be naive but the way he says it and i like to think it's true uh truth and justice are naturally stronger than their counterparts yeah and the only way they can lose if they is if they have inadequate representation and that's why sure everyone sh- that's why everyone should study rhetoric <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah because and, then, and the, also... the, then the truth and justice will win out as long yeah. as they have adequate representation, essentially. Yeah, but you made you made a really good point there, David, about what, what would what historians would call primary source material. The primary source material being what is recorded by the individuals who are there at the time and what they are experiencing. So people's diaries, people's text messages, people's tweets who are actually there, people's pictures who are actually there, the, the videos. I mean, these sorts vi- of videos right now. Yeah. There's a lot of talk right now about how many tanks and so on are the different sides losing, mm-hmm. um, and and Russia is claiming you know they've only lost a couple of hundred men and stuff like that, um, and it's refuted by clear video evidence where you can even read like the serial number of the different tanks that have been taken mm-hmm. that they have lost as many as they have lost indefinitely and perhaps more but these are just the ones that we have clear video and photographic evidence of. Yeah, so yeah. There are people working overtime on those things just as 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 a service essentially to try to make sure that we have um not everything lost in the in in the fog of war that we have a good basis for our understanding of what's going on and and how things are developing yeah yeah very interesting i I like that you make this distinction between between facts and misinformation because it's so it's so topical now and it it feels like it's more important than any than any other time in history I, i think i don't think i'm being over the top in saying that just because the spread of information is is rapid. You you look even something like the Arab Spring that happened. What was it, twenty eleven or so, when the Arab yeah. Spring happened, and and the the role of Twitter in that to to org to organize people, but not just to organize people, but also to incite this this uprising against the, the status quo. And it was so alarming to see that. In some way, you know, some people say, well, it's fantastic. You know, people power to the people and everything else. But but it, it it cuts in various different ways because who knows how how it's going to be used or or how people are are necessarily going to move on that basis. What so, what 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 Aristotle Arso, said is that giving power to the people means giving power to those who can persuade the people to a certain extent. 
Sure. Um, yeah. Right. And so there's a there's a, there's definitely a challenge there that we're um, there's a potential um, for for people to, and this is a little bit what has happened in every communications revolution really um, mm. is that is that uh, people have um, we we've already always had to kind of learn how to deal with it uh, because it's always been yeah. some kind of disruption, right? It's, mm. it's somehow it's it's disrupted. Um, the radio was uh, a major disrupt disruption and give power to voices that that otherwise wouldn't. You wouldn't be able to have the kind of, um, uh, in some ways, uh, censorship and uh, control, totalitarian control that you had in Nazi Germany without the radio and the, mm. the daily broadcasts from Goebbels and so on. But also you wouldn't be able to have the kind of reach of the fireside chats that uh, Roosevelt had. Sure. Um, when these new things come, people don't know how to filter them, mm. and they are often more powerful at the beginning. And then after a while, people get more used to the pitfalls and so on, and, and the different ways to deal with it, deal with things. Mm. Um, and what you really need in those times, uh, what is essential, is that you have people um, that have been trained not just to be able to think critically, but to maybe be able to make counter arguments against these powerful forces. Yes. So this is a, this is a quote from, uh, from John Dewey about uh, that by making the individual both the means and the end of democracy, and it's not easy democracy, it really requires a lot of the people that we kind of make the democracy for, um, society committed itself to investing its energies into creating individuals capable of possessing a moral will that achieves enough autonomy from dominant social forces that it is capable of reacting back on those forces with intelligence and power. Mm. So there's a lot that goes in there, definitely being able to have a moral will of your own, a lot of creation of character, mm. all those different things. But something that definitely has to be part of it, I think, is be able to analyze the sources of influence that are hitting us every day from every angle and in different kinds of media and being able to formulate our own arguments to potentially counter uh, waves of public opinion that may be uh, sweeping the country or our society or our family to places mm -hmm. where we don't want to go. And so you need to be able to have both the, the understanding of rhetoric in some ways of what's coming towards you mm -hmm. and the uh, rhetorical ability yourself as a rhetor to, to make a counter argument. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So different different skill sets and to use a sporting analogy more than anything else, it's it's having defense and offense in, in check and, and making sure that, that your game is on point in, in both respects. So with that exactly. in mind with that in mind, David, what, what sort of tips have you got for us? What sort of advice have you got for us in, in terms of how to do that, how to play defense against misinformation and also how to play offense in, in promoting good information that, that promotes good values that ensures people's freedom. Hmm. Um, I think uh, there's there's a lot that goes into that. Um, what I'd like to say is uh, perhaps rather than information, what we're talking about is what kind of arguments are you promoting, um, and thinking about a little bit about the basis of of where this is going to, uh, what this is leading towards, right? Hmm. Um, so, for the things that you know, uh, you need to be able to see that. Of course, everything that comes at you comes at you at an angle, from an angle, right? Yeah. Uh, anyone that's spreading things, they have an agenda. That doesn't mean that you suddenly just shut off everything and say like, "Oh, I don't believe anyone or anything," uh, mm. except for for some reason, some of these conspiracy theories people. This one person knows the truth, and everyone else is lying. <laughs> mm, sure. we're all controlled by we're all controlled by lizard man, didn't you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. So there's. Uh, uh, the, that's actually a, another one that's called uh, Kaim Perlman. He was a, uh, a, a, in the Jewish resistance during uh, World War II in, in Belgium um, and was able to actually save people from a train that was going to Auschwitz. One of the only uh, actually uh, successful attempts at, at saving people like that. Uh, and he wrote a book called The New Rhetoric. And he says that a problem is with, in philosophy, his, in his training in analytic philosophy, he was trying to make 
um, write a book about justice. And he found that his training in analytic philosophy gave him absolutely no basis for doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that based on that framework, the Nazis were as just as the Jewish resistance to Nazism. Mm -hmm. if we, cause, he, Cause he find that they were trying to make arguments by making, trying to make arguments too rigid and too kind of in some ways uh, robotic, it yeah. completely left out the human dimension. Yeah. Um, wow. And so, so what he wrote then is the new rhetoric, uh, which was a uh, Aristotle new Aristotelian attempt, essentially saying, okay, well, how do actually people na navigate these things? How mm. do we actually, um, in practice, you know, just for reading newspaper articles and literature and seeing all these different kinds of arguments people do use? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that he says is that um, uh, that. If all argumentation must be considered misleading form of reasoning, then the lack of logical experimental proofs would leave the fields of human reasoning wide open in all essential spheres of life to suggestion and violence. Because mm -hmm. you have like no reason basis for anything uh, mm -hmm. except for things that really aren't important at all. So if we can't mm -hmm. argue about ethics, for example, and those other things in any other way than just like analytical and logical. Um, mm. then we have no then we ha we can't say anything and everything becomes just either a matter of force or uh and or arbitrariness and just well nothing yeah. matters right? yeah so you have yeah. like the 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 relativist trap you could say i heard your ted talk about the hedonist trap that's this is the sure. re relativist trap right is that that yeah the, the st step from fanaticism to relativism is very very short uh, mm. they're both they're both based on there not being any basis uh, other than perhaps force for for anything yeah yeah right. yeah exactly how, how how do you how do you break it down how do you decide whether something is good or not for example how do you, how do you decide what what is good or bad I, I i'm very passionate about that very question itself because in the work that i do as a mentor i talk a lot to people about values the the mentor that i do is values based it isn't just it isn't just mere coaching and it isn't just talking about when I say mere coach, I mean, it isn't just a, t a talking shop and going through all the regular sorts of questions about where you want to be in five years and stuff, although that plays into it, but it's contextualized and it's contextualized around particular values in that person's life. So there is an orientation to it because there has to be an orientation to it. Otherwise, you end up with right. these sort of exercises that you get in, in, in corporate settings where you have somebody come in and say, oh, let's talk about your values. And they give you a list of 30 or 40 different values, devoid of any context. And they say, now pick your top five. And you think, well, how on earth is, is that helpful in any way, shape or form? Because I could be feeling hungry right now. And that's going to influence the answer that I give at that particular moment. Or I, right. might, be, I might be scared about a conversation I'm about to have with my boss. So that might influence how I, I feel about safety and these other things. So there has, there has to be a context to these things. We have to make some decisions about what sort of framework and what sort of orientation we're going to take in terms right. of deciding what, what good and less good and bad is going to be because we, we, have to, we have to do that. Otherwise, like you say, what, what, is, what is the basis? Otherwise, you can, you can look at things like Nazism and these other things that, that seek to take away freedom, that seek to introduce stratification and and domination as well and say well they've got the biggest gun they've got the most power so fair play that there you go you you do what you like and you set society up as, as you would want to do and that that to me almost sounds Nietzschean in terms of the the idea of of the the ubermensch and right. the, the the transvaluation of values the revaluation of values it's mm -hmm. you know this idea of the ubermensch Begets an, an untermensch. There has to, if there's going to be an overman, there has to be an underman. If there's going to be a superman. Right. There has to be something less than that. And so, it's it's quite interesting how these these things are are playing out as well. You mentioned Ukraine. I, I very much see that in relation to uh, Vladimir Putin's approach to to Ukraine and his viewpoint of the other Slavic nations as well. It's it's quite it's quite telling. I, I'm not going to try and psychoanalyze him from a distance, but it very much seems something similar to the will to power that is driving right. him forward in reclaiming this this revanchism that that is is being in, enacted now in horrific fashion very much seems yeah. like this so so it's so important isn't it to 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 really have a clear sense of what what good and bad is to us 
and in relation to our lives holistically, because we don't know what that is, then we can be manipulated, can't we? Right. That's exactly right. And uh, again, that's talking about being able to possess a moral will to get enough autonomy from powerful social forces and be able to react back on those with intelligence and power, right? Mm, um, yeah. Again, that's this this being able to say like, okay, actually, okay, so these are the different forces that are working on me right now and they're directing me in a certain direction. Um, are they good forces? Are they forces that I want to direct my life? Um, what are the things that I'm actually passion for based on my experience of things um and mm. and what are some things i'd be willing uh, uh you know uh irrespective of the praise or the condemnation i get for them to 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 risk things for to to do things for mm. right yeah yeah absolutely to I, to, I, to, to sacrifice things for yeah it's, it's, that, it's that having that self-knowledge isn't it? it's having the self-knowledge about what you're all about and if you don't know what you're all about then anybody on any given day can pull you around. It's kind of like in Pinocchio, when Pinocchio is tempted to go to go off and oh, don't worry about school, C- come to come to Pleasure Island with us. We'll have a, a gay old time and we'll smoke cigars. Turn to asses, we'll... yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's, yeah, it's exactly. that, that's it, and, and that, but that's the thing. So, so he's, he's manipulated on, on a single point, and he doesn't really see the the end from the beginning, so to speak. So he thinks it sounds a lot better than school. So let's go off and, and have fun. But the other thing, the other thing to mention on this as well, I, I was listening to some, I think it was um, somebody from Columbia Business School who was an expert in persuasion. I think it was Bob Bon Bon Tempo, if if I get his name right. But he was talking about persuasion, and what really struck me about that, and, and this relates to what you're saying about self awareness and self possession, was that unless we have self control, unless we're able to master ourselves and to not have our egos run amok then we don't really have much chance of persuading other people because we're going to, we're going to trip over ourselves. So it's similar to what you were saying there about having that, that self-awareness about what our values are and what's most important to us in a holistic sense, but also being able to not be driven by our egos because it strikes me that with this demagoguery that we're seeing so much of throughout, not just, you know, not in just in faraway places, but also in the Western world, we're seeing that a lot of it is, is, is playing into people's egos and the idea of, of their expected status. I should be this. I should be that versus other people. And it, it, it right. seems to me that we get, we get tripped up on that quite a bit, don't we? Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, I wonder if I could just uh, uh, go a little bit to kind of finish the, the point on, on the ethics, uh, yeah, go on ahead. ethics of rhetoric. Um, but, but uh, there was something I wanted to catch on to there. Yes. About, having a sense of, of identity, I guess, and then the sense of uh, this is what I stand for, this is who I am, um, and this is, what I want, this is what I want to fight for, and then being able to get the ability to react back on those forces, as it says, with intelligence and power, being able to find, okay, how can I formulate a good argument? How can I get people to join my cause? Um, how can I get people to understand me? Uh, because if you were to talk about uh, the the main things about rhetoric is that it, it's a it's a form of pleading. It's a form of mm. inviting the other person in the most powerful and uh, best way possible to share or to share your the the things that you're seeing in your mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and what you use as a bridge is your common humanity, the things that you have in common. You can you can use that as a bridge to invite them in to say it that way, yeah. and to invite them in the most in the most powerful way, that's that's what persuasion is. That's what's in my mind. That's that's what's persuasive. Mm. So there's a there's a certain ethics to the process um, in itself, even though it, you know obviously can be used for for bad ends. But it's better than doing it through, as I said, manipulation. Um, this is what Brian Garson says from uh, from Princeton University, from Princeton Un- or Yale University, where he says that. Um, that being persuaded, uh, we often talk about being persuaded, but actually there's a difference between being persuaded and being indoctrinated or brainwashed. The difference yes. lies in the active independence that is preserved when we are persuaded. Um, an orator does not coerce. He merely puts words into the air, air. Mental digestion that we go through is a process over which we can exert some, exercise some control. 
we reject arguments that seem far-fetched or suspicious. So being persuaded is not exactly the same as learning, but it is related to learning. Mm. So when someone sits back and decides, all right, you persuaded me, he's not merely describing something that's happened to him, some kind of process over which he had no control. So in, in spite of the grammar, he's describing something that he has done or participated in. Yes, yes. That's, that's perfect. I, I think that participatory element is, is a perfect way of putting it in terms of it not just being, you're not just a receptacle of information that somebody else is imposing upon you, but you are, you are actively assessing it. It's that critical thinking part right. of the, the process as well, isn't it? And, and taking it in and thinking, okay, well, again, you know, ethos, pathos and logos and, and looking, well, okay, is, is, this, is the source credible in the context that, that they're delivering this information? You know, does this resonate with, with how I feel about things without me being feeling like my heart's been, been ripped out or I'm being manipulated or having buttons pushed on me? And then is, is the logic sound as well? And, and I suppose we, we would do well to use ethos, pathos and logos in relation to our assessments of, of information that we receive as well. Definitely, um, yeah. To be able David, to analyze it in that same way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. D- David, I've got to ask, you, you've, you've thoroughly convinced me. I, I do quite a bit of public speaking myself anyway, but you've thoroughly convinced me that I, to, to improve my rhetoric skills even further and to, to be more engaged with rhetoric as, as an art in itself. So, so how can I and other listeners go about doing that? So, I mean, uh, the thing is what, uh, what I can kind of show people to go towards are some, some very good sources, but obviously there's some of them classical sources and other things. Um, they're obviously, when it comes to just being used to speaking in public and so on, there's Toastmasters and, you know, other, other, uh, mm-hmm. um, other places to go to other clubs and so on. But the thing is they used, this used to be, uh, you know, this, having like speech clubs debate clubs and stuff like that this used to be entertainment you know this is what people used to do the lyceums that uh, ralph mm. Waldo emerson used to go and present that and then afterwards that was followed by a debate and so on these literate societies where people were reading something and then they would debate the merits of it and so on um i mean the to a certain extent there's uh, there's a certain length you can go or a certain place you uh, amount you can go to through just uh, you know through reading things but then you have to put, try to put those things into practice yeah um, I would say that uh, some of the best some of the best books obviously are some of the classics when it comes to to rhetoric Aristotle's on rhetoric it's a bit heavy but it does uh, really help you to see okay what do I need to do what do I need to know about my audience uh, in order to understand what's persuasive to them, how they, how I can reach into them in the best possible way. Um, and um, then uh, there's uh, Cicero's on the, the Inventiona um, and the Rhetorica Ad Herennium are some of the classical sources where they're, they're quite practical. They're, they're a little bit like school books. I mean, Cicero talks about the Inventiona essentially being the notes he took from from his lectures um so there there are some some things there um obviously have a rhetorical leadership podcast where i try to share some of the things but a lot of it also goes on rhetorical theory and a little bit deeper than just the basic practice of it um and people are are welcome to to join there i also have a blog that i've been where i've been writing some things uh, called the intelligence of persuasion blog um so that's that's also another place to go. Fantastic. They're, they're great recommendations, David. And it has been an absolute pleasure to, to discuss this with you. This very, very topical theme, something that, that is really, really important for all of us at any time. Like, like you said before the, the call started, we need to know how to communicate. We need to know how to receive information as well. Receiving information, interpreting information is critical as well. So thank you so very much for your time on the Real Clear Values podcast. All right. Thank you.